Praise the Lord, regeneration. Praise the Lord, everybody. All right. So, you might hear this often, that praise the Lord, everybody, is us clapping our hands, right? I believe that when we say praise the Lord, that's a command. So, not only will we clap our hands, but we should open up our mouths too, amen? So let's try that again. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Oh, we serve an awesome God. Let's stand to our feet as we go into our worship time. How many love to call on that great name? The name that's above every name. His name is Jesus. Come on, clap those hands, everybody. Come on. Come on, let's get some energy. Hey. Bless you, Father.
lifting up that name, every situation in your life has to change. That name has never lost its power. So whatever you're going through, even in this morning, call on that name. And I guarantee you that that situation will turn around for your good. Because what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it around for your good. How many believe that this morning? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And as we continue to call that name this weekend, let us not be stagnant on where we are, but we are to move forward, to move forward in our faith with him, to move forward to a stronger relationship with our Father. So right now, as we lift our hands, this is our surrender and saying, Lord, we won't stay where we are, but we will continue to move forward in you. Lift your hands. Hallelujah. We invite you into this room now, Father. We open up our hearts and our minds. God, we love you. God, we adore you. God, we bless you. The sweet spirit that was in this room last night. Let it rain and let it shower over every individual in this room now. Wherever you are, just begin to open up your mouth and say something sweet to your father. God, we love you. Talk to your father. Talk to your father. And don't worry about who's on the left or the right. Begin to talk to your dad. I bless you. There's no one like you in all the earth.
to move forward we submit our worship back to the father for he created us to worship him and to worship him in what spirit and in so God the worship that you've given us will give back to you we won't hold it for ourselves for you alone are worthy for you alone are holy and deserving of our worship
worship the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> you in the back corner. Oh. Let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word this morning, we thank you that you've given us your word. We thank you that we can read it, that we can hear it, that we have ears to hear. And I see you now lifting up the bread of life and breaking it in half and causing it to multiply. And so I ask that, Lord. I ask that as we break the bread, the word of life today, that you would cause it to multiply, that you would fill us with understanding, fill us with new revelation. Fill us, Lord. May we have ears to hear. May we have hearts circumcised tender to your spirit, that we might be quick to not just be listeners of the word, but doers. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Uh, I don't think any of you really know me, and I'm not going to spend the time that the Lord has given me to share his word to really talk about myself, at least not right now. So in those little booklets, if you want to get like a little overview, a very snippet of my life and have any questions, feel free to come up to me afterwards and I'll answer. And later this afternoon, I will give a little bit more of my testimony. Uh, I was invited here to talk about revival Revival has been a passion of mine, but um, as somebody who has grown up in the Salvation Army, uh, the Lord had really put it on my heart to pray for revival, uh, not just for the Salvation Army, but for the church, but like start at home, right? Start at home. And so I would say that although I might this morning talk a little bit about revival in a very weird, windy kind of way, it really is we need to each start at home. Uh, and I would like to say that I think each of us, when I say we need revival, every single person in here is a differ different interpretation of what that means. Because some people might think revival means we need to do it better. And other people might think that revival means specific like more, uh, more worship in our meetings or more, you know, like they're thinking details. And so I would invite you uh, to kind of drop your expectation of what we might think revival means, not just for the Salvation Army or for the greater church, but even within your own heart, just for a little while. <laughs> so we can allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our minds and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, enlighten us and give us new revelation on what revival specifically will mean, not just for the larger church, not just for the Salvation Army, but also for you specifically in your heart and in your mind. Renew our minds, Lord. I want, to, I want to take you way back into the Old Testament because I love it. It's so violent. Nobody, nobody, nobody else? Just me? I know I got a brother back there who's like, yes! <laughs> Second Kings. Uh, it's one of the, it, it, it's one of, I'm going to tell you the story, so if you don't have your Bibles with you, that's fine. Uh, but if you do, you can follow along. I'm going to be reading from the TNIV, but you can uh, look into your scriptures to think, you know, like you might want to go, is that really in there? 
Like what she's saying right now, is that really in there? And you can look for yourself and see that it is. So in 2 Kings, uh, it's the story of Elijah. Now, Elijah was a man of God, and most of you in this room, I would imagine, know the story of when he stood up on top of the mountain, and he had like this showdown, right? And uh, he won, by the way, spoiler alert, uh, where fire came down from heaven. He called on the Lord, and fire came down from heaven and consumed not only the sacrifice, but also the water that was poured out upon the altar. And everybody on that day decided that they were going to follow the God of Elijah. And uh, the rest of Elijah's story, you can see it, um, you can see it in scripture, and I just think he's a crazy dude, so you should read it, because he's a lot of fun. Uh, he's all over the place emotionally. So any of you people out there who are feeling like you're all over the place emotionally, like one minute he's on top of that mountain going, fire! And the next minute he's like hovering in the corner and like birds are feeding him and he's like, I just wanna die. So like any of you people feeling like that ever any time at all, not me, you, you know, no. no. <laughs> uh, find comfort in the fact that God empowered this man and used this man to do great things. On the highs and on the lows. Uh, so here we find him near the end of his life. He's like super old at this point. And if you go into 2 Kings chapter 2, it's that whole, the way his life ended where the chariot of fire came and swept him up. Like just took him off. He got taken off in a chariot of fire. This is a man who was known as a, not just a man of God, but a man of fire. It's like wherever he went, fire. Right? Fire. Fire from heaven. He called fire down from heaven, fire came. And it's no different in 2 Kings chapter 1. So after Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel, and Isaiah had fallen, uh, the, uh, Isaiah, the, uh, Isaiah, Ahiah? Who's got the correct pronunciation of this man's name? Um, he also uses fallible people. There we go. Nobody's perfect. Uh, he fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria. Everybody say Samaria. Samaria. Thank you. Just making sure you're paying attention still with me. He injured himself. So what happened? He fell off like his balcony. And uh, so he sent messengers saying to them, go and consult Belzebub, the god of Ekron, and to see if I will recover from this injury. Now he's the guy in charge, right? He's the king. And he's sending him to a different god, to inquire if he's gonna make it out of this situation okay, that if he's, uh, because he's injured himself. Verse three, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, go up and meet the messenger of the king of Samaria and ask him, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going off to consult Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says, you will not leave the bed you're lying on, you will certainly die. So Elijah went. And when the messengers returned to the king, he said to him, why have you come back? He said, a man came to meet us, meet us, they replied. And he said to us, go back to the king who sent you and tell him this is what the Lord says. Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're sending messengers to consult Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, I, you will not leave your bed. You're lying on, you will certainly die. And the king asked him, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this. And they replied, he had garments of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, that was Elijah, the Tishabite. So now I imagine this much differently, right? So poor Elijah, he is the prophet of God and he's been given a word to tell the king. It's not, yeah, you're gonna be great, you know? Add a little honey, a little oil, you'll be all good. No, he was told what? You're gonna die. You're, because you did not go to God to consult God as the leader, because you as the leader, as the authority over my land, went to another God or, or you, know, you did not come to me, you're not gonna get better from this. There's no recovery. You're gonna die. And so when the messengers came and talked to Elijah, they went back you know, don't kill the messenger. They went back and they had to explain this to the king and he's like, who was it that told you this? What did he look like? And they start describing him and he's like, hmm, Elijah, 
right? His, <laughs> he's just like, oh, I knew it was Elijah. He knew it was Elijah. He knew it was Elijah when the word came back. And who was it that he was avoiding, who he didn't want to go and talk to, who he didn't want to seek? Like if he was seeking the Lord about whether he would get better or not, who would he have gone to? Elijah. Elijah was the prophet. Elijah was the man of God at the time. Elijah was the one he should have been going to, but he didn't. I just want to say, how many times in a day do we do things or say things without going to God? Who do you call first? Who do you text first? Who do you snap first? Or how do you turn it off so that you don't have to go to anybody? What are you watching or doing to avoid going to the Lord? Verse 9, then he sent to Elijah a captain with a company of 50 men. Everybody say 50. The captain, that wasn't everybody. <laughs> everybody say 50. You'll see why later. The captain went up to Elijah who was sitting on top of a hill. He's up on top of a hill and he said of him, man of God, the king says, come down. And Elijah answered the captain, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And then you know what happened? Fire fell down from heaven and consumed the captain and his 50 men. Say 50. 50. How many died? 50. 50. What's that? 51. All right. Always the scholars, right? The know-it-alls. They got it. No, that's true. <laughs> You're an officer, right? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The, uh, so what we don't know here, because this is translated into English, is that there is a play of words that's going on here that is absolutely fantastic. There is two words in Hebrew that are very close together, in the, not in the way they're spelt, but in the way, well, they're a little close, but the way they sound. So we have ish and esh. So ish, 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 who's putting ish up for me? I think we have ish, yeah, for the ish, ish. Ish means man, and esh means fire, right? So if he was say, if we were hearing this, if we were Hebrew, we were hearing this in their language, they would have been going up and saying, uh, ish of God, come down. And Elijah was saying, if I am ish of God, let esh of God fall on you. And I always, <laughs> I always have the strangest pictures in my head. I picture, have you guys ever seen Fred Flintstone, like when they have those like hearing aid things, which is like a ram's horn or something like that? And we gotta remember, Elijah's really old, and I can tell you, your hearing goes a little bit when you're a little bit older. And he's sitting up on this hill, and they all come forward, and the captain steps forward with his 50 men, which makes 51. Good math, I'm bad at math. So uh, you'll have to help me out later, too, when we like sum it all up. So he comes forward and he says, uh, man of God, ish of God, ish of God, come down. And Elijah is just, he's just old. He's just old and he knows who he is and he knows what he's doing and he's just sitting up there on top of the mountain. He probably doesn't want to move and he's probably like, eh, what'd you say? Did you say ish or ish? <laughs> and he said, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. The fire of God come down from heaven. And it did. And it did. And then what happens next is uh, somehow the king figures out that none of them came back. And so he does what? He sends another 50 men with a captain. So what are we up to? 102, right? And this guy also comes up to Elijah 
And he says the same thing, basically. He says, man of God, no, he adds a little bit. He says, man of God, this is what the king says. Man of God, this is what the authority over you says. Man of God, this is what the leader of this land says. He says, come down. And he said, if I am a man of God, does, do you think he's questioning it? No, he knows who he is. He knows who he is. He's saying, you don't know who I am. You're calling me by my title, but you have no idea who I am. So if I am a man of God, if I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you. And what happens? Fire comes down, and what happens? And they all get consumed, right? And I always wonder, was there somebody like standing off in the bushes who ran back and told the king? Because if they, if they were all obliviated, you're all wondering like, what does this have to do with revival? I'm gonna get there, people. I'm gonna get there, stay with me. So then the third, ki the third guy, so the king sends the third captain back with his 50 men, and the third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah, the man of God, and he begged. Everybody say begged. Please have respect for my life and the lives of the 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. For, so Elijah got up and went down with him to see the king. He approached differently, didn't he? He approached in a humble way. I mean, how many bodies did he have to step over? 102. And so he approached in a different way. So this time when he went forward, knowing, it, and you can also tell from the language of the way it was written that he had respect for the people that were following him. He was a different leader than the first two captains because he cared about the lives that he took with him. He wasn't careless with the other 50 men. He said, not only have mercy on me, but the, have mercy on the lives that are here with me. And so there was mercy given. And he came down and he went to see the king. I often wonder when I read this, I'm like, you know, I'm a woman of God right? And God is, in Hebrews 12, an all-consuming fire. Do you know who you are in Christ? He says that he is an all-consuming fire. So I've done my own kind of like connections, and I started to think to myself, I I'm a woman of God, which means I am a woman of fire. That's my identity because I am found in him. So if you are found in Christ, if you are in union with Christ and have a relationship with Christ, God is an all-consuming fire, which means you are fire. And of course, my human nature says, ooh, fireballs from heaven. You better watch out. It's a good thing you people don't know me. You'd be a little nervous right now. <laughs> Calling that, if you think I'm a woman of God, let fire fall down from heaven, right? What, was the, what happened, though, when Elijah called fire down from heaven? He destroyed, right? He took lives. I want you to jump into the New Testament. I want you to look at Luke 9, 54. Uh, it's also at the time where, you know, like the story about Elijah was like right near where he was taken, right before he was taken off by the uh, chariot of fire. And here we find Jesus, and it says in verse 51 of Luke 9, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. So it's like the, the, they're running parallel to each other, right? These, uh, these stories, they're very, and, and where do we find Jesus at this time, right before he's, uh, 
the time is approaching for him to be taken up to Jerusalem, we find him in Samaria, right? So it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resoutly set for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And when the disciples James and John saw this, they asked the Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And then he and his disciples went to another village. So where are the disciples? They're actually in the same place, Samaria. He was the king of Samaria, right? Where Elijah called fire down from heaven because the enemy was coming against him and he called fire because he knew his identity. He knew who he was, who he was. I'm a man of God, therefore there is fire that I can call down from heaven because I am a man of God, therefore I am fire. And so now the disciples are standing with Jesus and they know the scriptures, they know the story of Elijah and they know where they're standing and they know who they're standing with and they're making the connections and going, they're rejecting you just like they rejected Elijah. Let's call fire down from heaven and destroy them. They're like, we know exactly where we are in this story. And what does Jesus do? He's like, nah, except a lot harsher. It says he rebuked them, right? He says, we're not doing that today. But Elijah was a prophet. Elijah was a man of God who could call fire down from heaven. And you're Jesus. And he's like, no, that's not what we're doing. That is not what we're doing here. That is not why I came. Because you know, God is not only a consuming fire, but God is also love. And he came to represent the Father. He came down from heaven to represent the Father's love for us. He did not come to condemn and to destroy, but he came to set the captives free. And so when we call fire down from heaven, we are not calling down a fire to destroy our enemies or to come up against those who disagree with us or to get into political battles or battles about scripture or what your theology is and my theology is. We're not talking about a fire that destroys. We are talking about a fire that burns with passionate love for his people. Do you know how you will know that you are near a man or a woman of God? You will feel loved. We have forgotten how to love. We've been all about the fire. And you know how you know if you've been all about the fire, the fire of the old, the fire of the judgment? is because you feel shame. There's nothing you can do. You're already at a deficit. God created each of us, each of us, whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, whether you are an atheist, Muslim, whatever you are, however you identify, God created every living being. If you are breathing, you have spirit in you, and God has created you for his purpose. And there is a key inside of you, which Colossian calls the hope of glory. It is already in you. So we're running around trying to figure out how do I get more, at more God? How do I do this better? How can I do more? And we're striving and we're pushing. Well, the whole entire time, it is already programmed in us. And we just need to come awake to it. And we need to be people who are not throwing fireballs of destruction and fireballs of anger, but we are calling fire down from heaven and we know it to be the great passionate love of God. We're not doing that anymore. I'm not about that anymore. I am about loving the people around me. And let me tell you, 
we love poorly. Because if I have to work hard to earn your love, we also make God into somebody like us, right? We think God behaves like we do. We think he wants us to work for it. He's like, love you. What, what, what can I do? What can I do? I don't deserve it. Love you. I love you. Yeah, that sounds great, but you don't know what I've done. I loved you from the beginning of time. You're right, you don't get it. You don't get it. You're already there. You already have it in you. I grew up in the Salvation Army, and um, I must have sang, send the fire, more, like I wish you were there. You could have counted for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how many. A lot, right? How many people in this room have, uh, have sung, send the fire, send the fire, send the fire? How many? How many, right? You know what? I get the warm, fuzzy feelings. I remember standing and singing it as a very little girl next to my grandmother. My grandmother was a corps officer. I remember singing it in meetings, big commissionings with my uh, parents. And, uh, and because it was one that we always sang, you know, you know all the words and it's so, you know, yes, yeah, send the fire kind of thing and it gets you all stirred up. And uh, now we have some new renditions of it, which makes it exciting. And, um, and it's a good song, <laughs> and it's good words. And I don't think I ever really expect fire to come when we sing it. How many times do we as salvationists sing that silly song? And that's not blasphemy because it's not against Jesus. <laughs> Right? How many times have we sung that song and we're like singing it like we're like leading the forces, but we don't expect it? We're stuck in the sending the fire to destroy them. We're coming at people all wrong. I just urge you to shift your mind. Shift your mind to love. When I was a corps officer in St. Petersburg, Russia, I was called there. I had two small babies. One was four months old. One was just turning two. We'd been there about two weeks, and I didn't really know any Russian. And our congregation was like 350 like on every Sunday, and we had like bands, songsters, we had the whole thing, and we had like, uh, and, and because I didn't, like we had one sermon where it was given, and like the whole congregation seemed to move forward to the altar. And I had come from a really tiny core in Massachusetts before that, so it was super overwhelming, but I always loved ministering at the altar in the penitent form, and so I immediately, instinctively moved forward to pray with somebody and realized I couldn't talk to them. And even if I did talk to them, I couldn't, they weren't gonna understand me. And then I sat in my front seat of that auditorium and I just wept, thinking, what were you thinking? Why am I here? if I can't even communicate with these people. Like, why did you bring me here? And I began, uh, <laughs> there was a series of like a year and a half where they would come up to me and tell me, yeah, why are you here? And I was like, yeah, why am I here? And they're like, we didn't ask for you. And here I had this uh, ideas of grandeur because I had followed that scripture that says you leave your father and your mother and all these things behind, right? So I was thinking I was pretty, pretty spiritual or at least heading in the right direction. And the more the time went by and the more I couldn't build relationship or communicate and I couldn't do anything and they didn't like me and I realized as I was sitting in the front row as the Corps officer, I didn't like them. As a matter of fact, I will confess to you, I hated them. 
I resented them being there because they took me away from what my ministry, which was satisfying before, even though it was in a small core. I resented them for opening up, like I get big, right? So I resented them for opening up the work in, in Russia because I had to leave my family. I resented them because they didn't want me. They were rejecting me, so I rejected them back in my heart. And yet, because I was their core officer, I kept up the appearance of still loving them. So I put on this facade of trying to make an effort to make eye contact, to be present, to care about them, while all the time, deep in my heart, I was so mad at them and hated them. And it got to one point where I was sitting in that front row watching the service go on and everything finished and people went forward and I didn't care. In my heart, I knew it. Nobody on the outside could tell. But in my heart, I knew I just didn't care. I just couldn't wait for the meeting to be over so I could go home to my little apartment and feel sorry for myself. And I sat there and I started to weep. And people thought I was weeping for them. But I was just weeping, 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 and I couldn't stop. And then all of a sudden, I heard myself tell God, I don't love them. I hate them. I don't know why I'm here. And you know what? I can't make myself love them. I'm just going to be honest with you, God. I am done with this facade. I cannot work this up anymore. I cannot pretend anymore. So if you don't do something quick, they're all going to know it. <laughs> we are like at the breaking point because I am beyond done with them and their culture and their whatever it was. I was done. And it was like the Lord went, oh, finally. Thank you. How about you give me that? How about you give me that? How about you get out of the way and let me love through you? How about you stop trying to love them and focus on loving me and I, my great love for them, will fill you. Get out of the way. At least admit that you're not into it. Be honest, right? Stop pretending. Stop pretending. Stop saying all the right words. Whether you attend or you're an officer or you're a cadet, stop pretending. Stop. Stop. Stop hiding these fiery balls of anger inside ourselves and not just admitting like when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfigurations and Transfiguration and the disciples were down at the bottom and there was that kid that was flailing and throwing his body into the flames and the father said, your disciples couldn't help me. What could you do? And the disciples like, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we cast out this demon? Because earlier in the story, they had cast out demons. They, they came back to Jesus and said, even the demons submitted to us. But in this particular case, they couldn't do anything. And I feel like all the time, we're all pretending like we're doing it. And we all pretending like we care. When really, God just wants us to be honest. He just really wants us to be honest. He wants to come in a new way to fall upon us in love, in love. And when we approach him, because we recognize who he is, he is, a man, he is God, right? All-consuming fire. But we don't forget that now we know that that fire is love. That fire is love. Love, love, love. And you can't give people something you don't have. We always talk about spiritual giftings and everything. 
We, ha, we ta- how many people have taken a spiritual gift test at their, you know, discipleship, know what your spiritual gifts are? We don't talk about getting the spirit. Right? We say in the Salvation Army, oh, we say in the Salvation Army <laughs> that we don't believe in baptism of water. Right? And uh, I've preached extensively on this because, you know, it cut me open and I was, you know, red, yellow, and blue. Um, Because John himself told us that there was one who's coming after who is going to baptize with fire, that there is an upgrade, there is something better than the water, and it is fire. And the reason in the Salvation Army we don't baptize with water is because we believe in the baptism of fire. When do we do that? Are we doing that? Or we just got the right answer? We doing that? We calling people up and laying hands on them and saying, I baptize you with the fire of the Holy Spirit? We might be right theologically, but we're not practicing what we believe. We're not setting people on fire and sending them out. Because I can tell you something. There is no program, there is no youth event, there is no flashy stuff or the perfect situation that we can conjure up on our own. If you know who you are in Christ, If you are a man or a woman of God and you know that you are fire, you can sit up on that hill and rest, not striving, not moving, not changing the word that the Lord gave you, even though it's a bad word. And you can sit there in confidence, even if the authorities over you come to you, you can sit and rest in that place because you know who you are. You're calling me a a woman of God, but you're not talking to me like I'm a woman of God. But what's my response to them? Love, not destruction. I didn't come to condemn, I come to love. If you think about it politically, the way the political mayhem is going on in our country right now, and believe me, I'm not gonna get into that, but I am gonna say, all we're doing is throwing fireballs at each other of hatred. Nobody's listening to anybody. And What disturbs me the most is we, as Christians, we call ourselves followers of Christ. We got ourselves all messed up in it. We're all picking sides and thinking God's on our side. And when God hates everybody that you hate, then you're God. You've made yourself God. You've made yourself God. When you think you know the political party of Jesus, like he only lives in America, then you have made yourself God. You have made your opinions and have exalted your opinions over him. Does that mean we're not politically active? Of course not. Of course we need to be salt, right, to the earth. We need to be involved. We need to be, but how do we need to be involved? We need to be bringing in an atmosphere of love that represents who he is. Who is he? He is love, right? He's love. I was coming back from the dining room with my friend Amy, and uh, if you have not met Amy yet, you probably will. She's hard to miss. Uh, she's in the prayer room right now, I think, but um, she's never been to a Salvation Army function before. So when she just comes up to you and hugs you and tells you, you know, what her name is, she's just super, like, good at loving people. She's just like, she's so good at it. She, I just stand there going, oh, I want to love like Amy loves. But Amy's just loving people like Jesus. And so we're coming out of uh, where we ate. I'm sorry, I don't know your camp. So we're coming out of where we had breakfast this morning. 
and we're coming around and we're looping around. I forgot my phone because I'm always forgetting my phone and my keys and things. And I was heading back to the room to get my phone and uh, Amy says, blind beggar? What, 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 what is that? Like, what are you people declaring over yourselves? Blind beggar? Like, why is there a blind beggar cafe? That sounds, somebody who's never heard the story, right? Who in here has never heard the story? I might get it wrong. Somebody might else say, wait, stay, stay tuned, because I might need you for, right? The blind beggar uh, is not just a cafe over here, but it was the pub, right? Where William Booth, was he in front of the pub? Is that how it goes? He knelt down and said, the Lord will have all of me, all there is of William Booth, in front of the blind beggar. He knelt down and said, God will have all of me, all of me. And so now in the Salvation Army, we name things the blind beggar. After a pub, you're not allowed to go into the pub because we don't drink, <laughs> but you're allowed to name your cafes pub, like blind after pubs. I guess that's how that's okay. That's how that works. But, uh, oh man, the weight of this, of what the Lord said to me out there. <sighs> Is we've become blind and we're begging and we don't have to beg because he is a God with open arms who lovingly wants to lavish his love on you in abundance. We don't have to beg. And William Booth was in the right place, not he was there saying, have all there is of me, Lord. And look what God did, right? And now somehow we have shifted our minds and we're just begging, oh Lord, we remember what they did in the past, do it again. You know what they used to do in the Salvation Army? They tell me they used to have levitations. People used to levitate. How cool would that be, right? You seen any of your car sergeant majors or Sunday school teachers or your officers levitating? You give me a call. I wanna know, I wanna be there, I wanna see it. There is a man who used to be a great revivalist. He's passed away now, but uh, he has this video on YouTube where he talks about how the Salvation Army was so charismatic that they used to scare the Pentecostals. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? I am convinced that they sewed the Salvation Army uniforms really tight under the arms so you can't lift your hands up to worship. And we used to be, we used to be scaring the Pentecostals? What? And so we remember back fondly, and we do it so proudly. You know, we've allowed women to preach since 1865. We are, you know, we are, of course, we believe in the equality of women, as long as they stay in the women's department, right? I got no men's department. You're not gonna invite me back, I know, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> related, right? I told you. So here's what I'm saying. We are constantly, we are constantly looking back and we're onward Christian soldiers. We are constantly, what was that song we were singing? I was just like, yes, this is the song. This is the moment for this song where it was saying we're moving forward. We're moving forward. You cannot, as an army, stand up and be in unity and move forward if we are constantly looking back at what they did behind us. Now, does that mean we don't honor it or respect it? Of course we do. Those people were my relatives. I don't want to talk against family, right? But now, like, I am a crazy person and no longer fit in where before I was the norm. You were the norm. We were like regular people, the weirdos. You know how the king knew who Elijah was? Because he was a weirdo. He was like, was he wearing camel hair? Was he, was he eating locusts? Yeah, I know who that guy was. That was Elijah, the man of God, because he stood out, because he didn't change his word. 
when they came back two, three times and said, we don't like what you're saying, so we're coming back again to take you to the king. And he's like, I'm not changing the word the Lord gave me. Send the fire, right? Send the fire. What are we hoping for? What are we looking for? What does that look like with the army? Because what I hear Jesus saying to his disciples is we're not doing that anymore. I'm doing a new thing. And you're so hung up on how it happened before. Yeah, and guess what? That was Elijah. Well, guess what? That was William and Catherine Booth. And he's going, that was great. Yeah, that's what happened here. Yeah, that's what happened here. Right in front of the, be the blind beggar, William Booth gave his whole heart to God, and it was a beautiful moment. That was back then. What about now? What about now? What about you? Because that was for that generation, and we're talking to this generation. Rise up. Rise up. Wake up. Where are the William and Catherine Booths in this room? I'm not talking about the uniforms. Even their uniforms were cooler. Right? The long things and the capes. I would have rocked a cape. I remember, Lord, of the things that you've done in the past. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In our time, make them known. Do it again. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, but do it in me. Do it again. And it starts with knowing who you are and walking in that authority and knowing whose you are and walking in that identity and speaking God's word with the authority that he's given you, with the spirit he's given you. There are people in this room who are already baptized by the fire. There are people in this room who already have the Holy Spirit on them. And the thing that you're lacking is identity and confidence and encouragement. Look to the person to your right and say, the hope of glory is in you. Now look to your person on your left, the hope of glory is in you. It is already there. It is already there. If you need to tweak anything at all, it's to know and receive that you're loved. That you're loved. You are loved just as you are. You don't have just as I am, right? Just as you are. You are completely loved. He starts off there. You don't start at a deficit where you have to work up to it. You already start off at love because that is who he is. We're not doing that anymore. We're not begging. We don't have to beg for him because we already have him. We don't have to ask him, love me. Like, I, I need your love. You already have his love. You need to start shifting your minds. A healing of the minds, I speak over you, that you're able to receive and to understand and to know how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. That is why the song, Jesus Loves Me, is so powerful. Because it takes us back to the basics. And we need to sit there reminding ourselves that it's not about throwing fire of hatred or opinions or judgment, but that it is about the fire of love. God is love. And they will know me by my love. And they will look to you we were talking about clean up the house first. Love each other. This is my commandment, that you'll love each other. Catherine Booth says that we have tried programs, we've tried buildings. Catherine Booth, we've tried buildings, we've tried programs, we've tried statistics and all sorts of other things. But have we tried the fire? Because fire, if you are on fire for God, that's contagious. That's contagious. You don't need a program. Somebody just needs to be near you, and they catch it. Right? Flame stirs up flame.
Let's pray. Lord, may our words and our teachings match our actions. We do ask you to forgive us, Lord. For we have not followed you. More like the king of Samaria, we've gone to every other opinion. We've called a friend, but it wasn't you. And if you hold anything against us, Lord, it's that we have not sought you out and that we have not acknowledged that, or maybe we just can't understand because of the way love is shown in this world, how much you love us. I invite Holy Spirit that in this room at this time that you would just, oh, pour your love down, Lord. Send your love. Send your fiery, passionate love. Send it down in this room, Lord, in such a new way. We think it was good before, Lord, but touch us. Do a new thing in us. Raise up, Lord, your soldiers. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is a soldier in God's army. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is a so soldier in God's army. Raise up. Raise us up, Lord. Not to have it all right, but to love. To love, to love, to love. May we know that you love us. May it begin at home. May it begin in our hearts, Lord. Where there is anger, where there is hatred, even within us, may we just be honest and say, I'm not doing this well. I don't love well. I don't, I don't even love myself sometimes. Lord, show me your love. If you want to experience his love today in a new way, if you want to experience his love in a way that is greater than what you've experienced thus far, and I know that a lot of you have already experienced his love, but there's more. It's not a stream, it's Niagara Falls. You know, like it's more and more and more and more. Lord, pour out your love on us that we might know you. Because when you set our hearts on fire, there's no going back. There's no looking behind. We have faces like flint moving forward, onward, forward, forward forward to spread the fiery, passionate love of our, your Son, Jesus Christ. The music's going to play. We're going to have some time to just wait on the Lord. And I would invite you, if you don't have if your mind's busy with all the things that you feel like you need to bring before the Lord, I would suggest to keep it simple and say, show me your love, Lord. Forgive me and show me your love, Lord. Show me your love. Show me your love. Show me your love. Putting hatred behind us. We're dropping anxiety. We're leaving performance behind us. Show us your love, Lord. Show us your love. I'm going to do something a little bit different, too, during this time while we're worshiping. Uh, you could 
nothing's really expected of you except that you would open up your hearts and minds to the Lord and allow him to come in in a new way. And you can do that from your seat. But I made a almost flippant comment about the baptism thing earlier and about how we, uh, we don't do that. We talk about what our theology is, but we don't baptize with fire. So I thought, why not now? So those of you who you know that you have the Holy Spirit in you, that the Lord has opened you up in that way, and I am telling you, do not play with God. If you are second-guessing in any way and you need to be on the receiving end, just don't, there's no shame. There's no shame in that. Even if you're an officer or a cadet, maybe you're a commissioner, who knows? You know, like, <laughs> like there's no shame. Don't move unless he tells you to move because what did the king do? He went somewhere else to ask an opinion. Don't even listen to your own opinion. Just ask the Lord right now, Jesus, what should I do? Should I be one standing there or should I be one receiving? Should I be giving or should I be receiving right now? But I know that there's people in this room who I'm going to ask if they would stand up there, if they feel that they're the givers, that they know that they have the fire of God in them and they want to extend that. And I'm also, I'm, I'm going to be there. And you know what? Let's line up and just pray. It doesn't have to be long, lengthy prayers. We don't have to be sharing or confessing with each other. But if you're like, I want, I want to be baptized by fire, then it says that the elders, the leaders, are to lay hands upon you, right? Let's do that. Let's stop saying that that's what we do, and let's actually do it. And if you don't feel like you want to move off of your mountain right, right now, <laughs> if you're not in that place, then just rest in his love. Open your hands up in your seat and just worship him and rest in his love. There's no pressure. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He loves you. Like, if you're not ready, cool. If it scares you a little bit because you're afraid you're going to be the one who's going to be levitating, cool. <laughs> Might want to wait a little bit. But let, let's expect more. Let's hunger for more. Let's desire more. So I don't know this territory very well, so I don't want to start calling you people out, but the ones who know they should be up front, and it... it and I'm not talking officers like anybody. We're taking the rank off right now. I'm a used-to-be colonel. Who cares, right? Jesus doesn't wear a uniform. God doesn't have a rank. Well, he is the commander of, well, anyway, let's not get sidetracked. Right? Okay. Holy Spirit, we are moving into this season where we are desiring as your church for more, more, more of your spirit. We have preached from the Salvation Army that, about a baptism of fire, and we don't know what we're asking for. We have called fire down from heaven, send the fire, send the fire for generations, and we don't know what we're asking for. Lord, reveal yourself today to these people, that they might be ignited to ignite others, but first that they might know the fiery, passionate love of the Father for them. Ha, barabasit, ha, ha, come, Lord Jesus. Come, move amongst us in a new way. We're not doing that anymore. Oh, how hard is that for our ears of traditionalism to hear? We're not doing that anymore. We're doing something new. We're doing love, love, love. When you're ready, just as we worship, you see the people standing there, you know who you are to go to, and if you don't, Lord Jesus, who should I go to? Go to them. And all I invite you to do is the only instruction we're given today is do not make it long. Just place your hand upon their head or their heart or their arm and say, I give to you what the Lord has freely given to me. Fire of the Holy Spirit, love of God. I give to you what the Lord has freely given to me. Fire of the Holy Spirit and the love of God. I give to you what the Lord has freely given to me fire of the Holy Spirit and the love of God. That's it. Let's not make it complicated, right?
not make it complicated. Come, come, come.
Jesus, the Lord reminded me of a dream that I had when I was 13 years old. I'll never forget it. The dream was a group of people just like we are assembled now, bowed down in the presence of our Father. And on each person's head, there was a fire and some of the people, fire was black, black fire. And then there was fire that was orangish red. And as we were in this place of worship, the enemy tried to come in and tried to sift those with, with the black fire. But I decree and declare that now is the time for the reigniting of the fire within us. This is not just a conference, this is not just a another service, but this is an encounter with God to reignite the fire that has been burning inside of you so that when the enemy tries to come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will rise a standard on your behalf. So as we continue to sing this song, just begin to sing that over yourself. Consume us with his fire. Consume us with, with the fire of love, to love our neighbors, love our enemies, love ourselves. That's the prayer of the faith I want to say, consuming fire, consume. We want to burn for you, consume. Burn it. Ignite the fire within us, Lord. Whoa, consume it.
My desire is for you to fall. Oh. Ignite the flame within us, Lord. Oh. Rising in the room, oh, <laughs> oh God, we need you to fall, Holy Spirit.
Invited in the room. You're invited in the room. We won't ever leave your prayers. Stay here forever. You can stay here forever. You are my glory, you are my glory, the one 
Father, we thank you for your sweet presence. Thank you, Lord, for ministering to us, for walking with us, for loving on us, for filling us with the bread of life. Lord, we sang earlier the song of going forward. Oh, that our eyes and our face may be like flint set upon you, that we might go forward and not look back finishing the race that you set us out upon. And I speak this as grace over all of you. The work that he began in you, he will bring it to completion. He is the author and perfecter of your faith. You don't have to work up faith. He is faith. We don't have faith in our own faith. We have faith in him. Our hope is in him. Our reputation is in him. Our righteousness is in him. Our salvation is in him. It's all about him. Lord, as we move forward into the rest of this day, make us mindful to be encouragers, to be speaking words that are in a line with your opinion and not our own, to be speaking words of life to each other, even if it's uncomfortable, to be standing in agreement with your spirit of how you love each person here and how your heart just longs for them to be in an intimate relationship with you. Give us eyes to see that we might not be blind beggars, but that we would be like that little boy kneeling and saying, all of me, Lord. Take all of me, open our eyes that we might see. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, yeah, you could do it, sure. <laughs> Whew. We're late, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is what we're here to do. Um, I'm going to invite my friend Steph up to share about a great opportunity we have to support uh, a revival in, uh, in the West African country of Mali um, and opening Bible camps. Uh, there so that they can hear, experience, and rejoice in this truth as well. So um, let's give Steph some encouragement. Wow. <laughs> I just kept praying, I love you too. I love you too, God. Because he is telling us every second of every day I love you and all we need to say back is I love you too. So if it's okay, <laughs> um, this morning I wanted us to tap into our imaginations a little bit. Is that okay? <laughs> I, 
Okay, <laughs> so sit back in your chairs, get comfortable, um, do whatever you need to do, and close your eyes. And just imagine with me for a moment. 12 years. You've had this illness for 12 years. 12 years of being ignored, shamed, outcast, forgotten. 12 years of pain. 12 years of bitterness. One day, you're sitting with the sun beating down on you, and it feels like any other day. You're sitting on a dirt road outside the city. It's where you have to be. It begins to get noisy, and you see a crowd forming. This strikes you as strange, but for some reason, you find a glimmer of hope in the whole scene. You've heard about this Jewish rabbi who's been performing miracles, and something inside you knows that he can heal you. So you push through the crowd. You try your best to ignore the dirty looks and rude comments. Almost all of your energy has been exerted as you fall to the ground. With one last bit of energy, you reach out and touch his cloak. What happens next is a bit of a blur, but the Jewish rabbi stops walking and notices you. You don't have the energy to hide or even panic, so you just sit there trembling at his feet. As you begin to explain yourself, he stops, and the words that come out of his mouth are a soothing surprise. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Um, I share this story because I'm so inspired by the faith of the bleeding woman and the immediate compassion of Jesus. Faith and compassion. Think about those things as I introduce the missions project. Um, as you might have already heard through social media or maybe from me because I'm really excited about this, um, <laughs> and I keep talking about it, <laughs> uh, we're raising money for a Bible camp in Mali. And as, as I was preparing to share this, project with all of you, I learned a lot about Mali and the Salvation Army in Mali. Before this project, I was kind of like, Mali, I'm pretty sure that's in Africa. Um, but as I learned, my passion for this project, the people involved with the project, and the country grew and grew. Regeneration, God wants to use us, and through him, we can make a difference. My goal is for you guys to feel connected to our brothers and sisters in Mali. So here's a quick lesson. Mali is in Northwest Africa, um, and it's the farthest north in Africa that the Salvation Army is present. And a lot of the country is made up of the Sahara Desert, and only about 3% of the country identifies as Christian. Despite being small in numbers, the Salvation Army is a mighty force there. The region has about 345 senior soldiers and 160 junior soldiers, which is about the amount of people in this room right now. 80 women completed a literacy program, and that has led to so many opportunities. And there have also been conferences that are held about um, polygamy, female genital mutilation, and domestic violence. Salvationists in Mali are committed to evangelism and fighting against injustices. To stay committed to these things takes a lot of faith and compassion. So here's the part I want you guys to pay attention to because it's really cool. Um, the goal of these Bible camps is to empower women and teach that men and women are equal. So men will have the opportunity to be open about the challenges that they face within their families and learn about women's rights, and women will be empowered by receiving biblical teaching in a country where that opportunity just doesn't come very often for women. So I wanna challenge you all to replicate that unwavering faith and compassion into your life. And we can start here at Regeneration. 
with the help of the Holy Spirit, and um, we have to um, raise a little bit of money also. <laughs> Um, so our goal is to raise $4,500, and so I know that sounds like we have a lot of work to do, but I have good news. Um, THQ agreed to match whatever we give, so for every dollar that we give, THQ will also give a dollar. Um, and so we're going to have a few opportunities to give this weekend. Um, we're going to be in Sequoia during free time with the other things happening there, and we'll be selling some notebooks and prints. Um, my sister, uh, she's really talented, and she can do like cool calligraphy handwriting like that. So um, come with a quote or uh, scripture, song, lyric, anything, um, and we can make that. <laughs> um, and then also, um, I'm going to try something new where if you want, um, find me. I meant to bring my phone up here, but Morgan also made some phone backgrounds. And if you want to like give any amount you want, <laughs> I can send that to you um, and you'll, yeah. Um, and then we're also going to have something fun at the banquet. Um, you guys can come in. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, <laughs> so you can crush your crush. Um, you can send your crush a can of orange crush soda. And I know some of you are thinking, I don't have a crush, I'm not going to participate. Well, I have good news. Um, you can send grape crush to someone for being a grape friend. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, you can also, so, so also for the recipients of the soda, you can find out who sent you this soda um, for a dollar. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be selling that um, at lunch. We're going to be selling orders. You can order it at lunchtime, um, free time at that same table, and during the banquet, if we have any left, um, and the, all the deliveries will be made at the banquet, so you don't want to miss out. So that's all I have time to share with you about that. Um, and come find me, ask any questions if you want to learn more. Um, but I also wanted to talk really quick about another opportunity to give, and that's Summer Mission Team. So <laughs> can I have um, some of our friends come on to the stage who we talked? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, and as they're coming up, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the program. Um, it's seven weeks long. It's a leadership development program. Um, a lot of people have done summer mission teams, so ask them about it. Um, and it's just so amazing to see how God works in these young adults' lives every single summer. Um, and this summer we're going to Kenya, Brazil, and Panama. And the Central Territory um, have some TBD overseas um, opportunities as well. Um, so, and applications are due February 19th, I wanted to say that. So you don't have that much time. <laughs> um, so now I'm gonna hand it to Captain Liz. So yeah, I was really blessed to be able to par participate in Star Missions team. Uh, and uh, God just revealed to me uh, through that experience that ministry starts right now. Ministry starts right now, and he can use me in whatever way. And so I just encourage you to participate. It's, a, it's an awesome experience. Uh, my name is Sam Arias, and in 2014, I, uh, I was part of the Central team, and in 2015, I was able to lead the Kenya team, and uh, during those two years, God taught me so much, but the main thing that I took away from my time at SMT was that we need to do the hard thing. 
SMT is not going to be easy, but it's going to be a blessing. And um, if we don't do the hard things, we won't grow. So um, if you think SMT will be hard, you're right, and you should still sign up. Hi, my name is Shannon. And I'm a first year cadet, and I share that because SMT plays a big role in how I approach the College for Officer Training. And I, the first year I did SMT, I went to Mexico, and my fearless team leader is out here, Greg Harula. Um, and after that year, God changed my heart, and I ended up adding a minor in Spanish so that I could really grow in my skills to translate. Because the next year, I went to Costa Rica. And the year after that, I led the team to Spain and Portugal. And the team, yes, and the team after that, um, I led the central team. And we went to the Bahamas also. But what I have to share with you is that God can use you anywhere. And if you're thinking about doing SMT, you need to be also willing to do all that in your own core, in your own community, in your own city, and in your own family. I think you have an amazing experience. I wanted to see the Salvation Army worldwide. I was introduced to all these other people in the Army my own age, as well as the global impact that the Army has. SMT is also a really humbling experience. We oftentimes don't realize what we have. It'll open your eyes to new cultures and to like new ways of thinking. Summer Missions team is a great chance and opportunity to be able to experience other cultures. It's so cool to be able to see how God works in other countries and in other contexts and to be able to worship in another language. Uh, if you're looking to learn more about yourself and grow more into God. To share the gospel in another country and serve people. Being able to connect with them through Jesus Christ and ministering to them. To communicate with people and create lifelong friendships. You're giving to others and they're also receiving from them because we have a lot to learn from anybody. The impact that you can have on someone's life is just tremendous. And some immersion team will give you that opportunity. Yeah, do that, <laughs> for real. So I have two quick announcements. One, we will not have small groups right now. <laughs> Just go to lunch, but don't go early because it freaks them out. <laughs> right? Yeah. So go at noon. Uh, that's one. And then the second one is, if you haven't gotten a t-shirt, please grab one on the way out. We'll have some people there to help. Um, and also, third announcement, bonus. Uh, sign up for the open mic uh, if you want to perform. Go see Sam in the lobby right after this. But be blessed and enjoy your afternoon together. <laughs>